Hi everybody, I'm Jack Gallagher. You know, we pass them a thousand times on the way to work. We encounter new ones every time we do an internet search for directions. And without street signs to guide us, most of us would never get past our own curb. But how many times do you really stop to think about how a street got its name? Well, if you're anything like me, the answer is never. Until they asked me to do this show, and I'm glad they did, because it turns out there are some fascinating stories behind street names, not just in Sacramento, but in Folsom and Elk Grove and Stockton and all over the region. What's in a name? Well, we're about to find out on Street Signs. There are thousands of miles of streets in our cities, our own version of the asphalt jungle. Some of the oldest, like Auburn Boulevard, were so named not in recognition of neighboring towns, but because at one time they were the only way to get there. No Interstate 80, no Highway 50, just dusty stagecoach trails that became ribbons of asphalt connecting a growing Central Valley. Early pioneers established their ranches along the old Auburn Road, and from early spring to late fall, heavily loaded freight wagons were the primary vehicles of commerce. With the advent of the horseless carriage, travel between the cities was faster, but not always expedient. There's a wealth of history in these connector streets that reach all points of the compass. Stockton Boulevard and Folsom Boulevard are the longest and most traveled today, while some, like Franklin Road, Florin Road, and Freeport Boulevard, went to cities from our past that no longer exist. In the Arden Arcade area of suburban Sacramento, you'll find a crisscross of major streets bearing the names of inventors. This street corner remembers Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone, who so famously uttered the phrase, Watson, come here, I need you and Thomas Edison, who counts the light bulb, the phonograph, and moving pictures among the more than 1,000 patents in his name. Just down the road, another intersection commemorates James Watt, who perfected the steam engine, and Eli Whitney, who patented the cotton gin. You may have been gridlocked on streets named after the Flying Wright brothers. Elias Howe, who brought us the sewing machine, or Samuel F. B. Morse, the dashing creator of the telegraph. And then there's this well-known crossroads, Fulton and Marconi Avenues. Robert Fulton has to his credit both the steamship and the first submarine, and Marconi is widely but incorrectly acknowledged as the father of radio broadcasting. But no, the real credit goes to a little-known Serbian-American, Nikolai Tesla, whose shocking experiments with man-made lightning bolts in Colorado at the turn of the century were the real impetus for today's radio. This easily forgotten genius was nearly passed over by city planners as well, no major thoroughfare for old Nikolai, just a small, dead-end street off Fulton Avenue. All right, Fulton, Watt, Marconi, all household names, right? But Nikolai Tesla? Who is this guy with the lightning bolts? I actually think it's named after Tesla, Sacramento's best-known rock band. But you decide. Tucked away in downtown Sacramento, there's a hidden little street called Terminal Way and a lesson that what's old has a way of becoming new again. Until it was torn down in 1941, Terminal Way looked like this, home to Union Station, the heart of a once bustling trolley car system that got its start during the late 1800s. Originally, it was a system that served the area around the waterfront. William Berg is the author of Sacramento Streetcars, a book that traces both the rise and demise of the Sacramento trolley car. The City Street Railway was the first official streetcar company, and they opened on August 20th, 1870, and they were owned by R.S. Carey, and the rides were a nickel. That nickel fare didn't change for nearly 80 years, but technology would. Before roads were fully developed, electric rail cars, known as interurbans, became the preferred mode of travel between California cities. And in order to operate these trains within a city, companies had to offer something in return. Typically, in order for an interurban to get permission from a city to run through their downtown area in order to have the most convenient destination smack dab in the middle of downtown, they also had to provide local streetcar service. It was the birth of the local streetcar system. Sacramento became home to three different streetcar operators, PG&E, Central California Traction, and Northern Electric. And for decades, the streetcar was a ubiquitous sight downtown. Ideally, with streetcar service, as soon as the first car is disappearing into the distance, the next car is coming up out of the distance in the other direction. 
But to make a profit, streetcar companies had to offer more than just reliable service. So they got into the real estate business. They helped build both East Sacramento and Oak Park. If you have a subdivision in the era before cars and it's way out past the edge of town, there's really no way for a potential customer to get there. If there's a streetcar line already there, that means there's guaranteed of investment. Today's McClatchy Park was once an amusement park called Joyland, and McKinley Park, formerly called East Park, actually featured a zoo. Streetcar companies built them both. They're making a little money off the streetcar, generally not much, and they're making more money off the customers once they arrive. So, what happened to the streetcars of yesterday? There's hardly a trace left. There is a car barn on N Street and 28th that's currently used by Regional Transit, which was originally part of the shops complex for PG&E's streetcar system. Most people believe that what caused the boom ultimately brought the bust, the suburbs. After World War II, Sacramento grew in every direction and the bus became the more popular mode of travel. It just wasn't cost effective to build the infrastructure needed for streetcars and the tracks were paved over. And now the irony, four decades after the streetcar tracks were paved over for buses, tracks were laid again for light rail. But today light rail is falling out of favor and in some cases could be replaced by, you guessed it, restored streetcars. Well, this is a restored streetcar that actually ran in Sacramento. Uh, it was built in uh, roughly 1913 and ran in Sacramento through the teens, 20s, 30s, into the 1940s. Light rail's gotten to be expensive. It's uh, in the range of 45, 50, 55 million dollars a mile to build. And now in Sacramento, you're seeing a resurgence of people moving back into the center city and moving back downtown and a, and a, and a growth of business downtown again. And, and so it's kind of a natural thing that we're looking at moving people around the downtown area more easily and we're back to streetcars as a technology. Vintage streetcars aren't in Sacramento quite yet, but in the meantime, you can experience what they once were at the Western Railway Museum in Rio Vista. You can even ride an original Sacramento Northern streetcar. What we're doing here is keeping a heritage alive. Yeah. You see, this is how your grandparents got around, mm -hmm. and this is how your children's great-grandparents got around. And remember how old things have a way of becoming new again. Sometimes ideas need a time to fade away and go out of fashion before people start to get nostalgic for them. When people see an old streetcar and people hear the bell, there's they're something that touches people, and it's still, with all of those things, a modern way to get around. And who knows, Terminal Way may come full circle and be home to trolley cars once again. So, as we've seen, when you're starting a city from scratch, you want the street names to be functional, easy to navigate. Then as you become more established, it's easier to be a little bit more creative. And this goes for cities and towns around Sacramento as well. In fact, a lot of these street names don't just tell you where you are, they tell you where you're going. For instance, Bruceville Road was the way you got to Bruceville. Calvine Road took you to the old California vineyards. And Elk Grove Boulevard, well, that's the way you get to, you guessed it. Elk Grove came from James Hall, who migrated here from Galena, Illinois in 1850 and was on his way to Stockton and saw this land here. And he homesteaded 160 acres of land uh, right here on Upper Stockton Road. Some say that Hall brought the name Elk Grove with him from Elk Grove, Missouri. Others say he was inspired by herds of elk migrating through groves of oak trees along the Kasumnas River. Whatever the case, the name was evocative enough to lure other settlers to the small town. We weren't a shoot 'em up, bang 'em up town with OK Corral type shootings. We had a great history of being a profitable, being a friendly community. And I think when people think about Elk Grove from days past, we were a community. And that is probably one of the most wonderful things you can say about Elk Grove. We were a community. A community made up of farmers and farm laborers primarily. It was a simple life, and the townsfolk chose simple names for most of their main thoroughfares. A lot of roads were named for the ranchers or the farmers that lived at the end of the road. Uh, roads went from one place to another. We have Sheldon Road that went to the town of Sheldon. 
We have Grant Line Road, which was the actual Grant Line. It was a line from the back of Rancho Cordova that the Mexican government granted Sheldon. A lot of people assume that what we now call Old Town Elk Grove was where the community began, but the original Elk Grove was located further south where Highway 99 runs today. Over time, the town migrated north and east to allow better access to the railroad. If Elk Grove hadn't made that move, it might have suffered the same fate as the town of Washington, which once stood where West Sacramento is today. Some street signs provide a glimpse of an area long forgotten, or maybe one that's been replaced by something newer or brighter. This was once the site of the Washington Elementary School. Now all that's left here is the small dedication plaque and the street sign that still bears its name. The town of Washington was established by Margaret McDowell in 1846 after her husband died, leaving her 600 acres of land. Unable to provide for her children, Margaret broke up her land into plots to sell and named the new town Washington in honor of our first president. The town was later combined with the small towns of Bright and Broderick to form present-day West Sacramento, which was incorporated in 1987. What remains of those earlier towns are mostly memories. I think if we're going to preserve history, we need to value it. I think that's the first step, is to learn your history, value your history, and then preserve what you can of your history, or, or celebrate what is not here anymore, you know, to remember. There have been many individuals throughout our region who envisioned and created thriving cities where none existed before. And more often than not, these pioneers get immortalized on street signs. Take the name Weber. You see it everywhere around Stockton. Weber Park, Weber Point, Weber Street, Weber Avenue, Weber House. Who was this person who loaned his name to so many prominent places? Captain Charles Weber was the founder of Stockton, California. The area was originally named Tuleyburg, but in 1848, Weber renamed it in honor of his friend, Commodore Robert Stockton. The city became a major shipping point for products grown and manufactured throughout Northern California. It was also a stopping point for many passenger steamers that once navigated our rivers, boats such as the Delta Queen and the Delta King, which is today docked in Old Town, Sacramento, as a floating hotel and restaurant. Today, Charles Weber is remembered as the father of Stockton through the many streets and buildings that preserve his name. Having a road or a school named for someone who was an important part of the community keeps the history alive. Uh, it teaches the kids who go to those schools or the people who drive on those roads what happened in the past. Although many people will think of it as just a name, there are going to be those who do ask the question, why? And we will have the answers. So, we've traveled south down 99 to downtown Modesto at its famous arch, the gateway to the city and its streets. Now, its slogan, water, wealth, contentment, and health, has been a source of civic pride for nearly 100 years. But this wasn't the original idea for the sign. Imagine, if you will, the winning slogan. Nobody's got Modesto's goat. Sadly, they had to change the slogan when the Modesto goat wandered up to Stockton and became their goat, something about better benefits. I made that last part up. But the whole thing about nobody's got Modesto's goat is true, and we'll have more on that in a minute. Because to get a sense of this city and its historic street names, we first need to take a look back at where it all started. In the mid-1800s, the 125 miles between the Stanislaus and Tuolumne rivers was wheat country, and farmers dotted the landscape. But everything changed in 1870 when the Central Pacific Railroad came through. People in outlying communities literally dragged their businesses to the new rail station to get closer to the commerce it created. What started as a train stop soon became a city when Modesto incorporated in 1884, and today many of the street signs reflect the history and the people of this great community. For starters, there's Wright Street, named after Assemblyman C.C. Wright. In 1887, he developed legislation that brought irrigation to Modesto, which made farming possible. The significance of the Wright Act can't be overstated considering how important farming became to the entire state. A town jubilee was even held the day water began to flow. Then there's streets like Coffee Road, 
There's been coffees in Modesto since the town was founded, but today the name is often associated with heroes. Bud Coffee was loved for both his service as a World War I flying ace and for the airplane rides he offered when he returned from the war. But tragically, the town lost its hero in 1921 when a mechanical failure caused his plane to crash. Several decades later, people in Modesto thought they lost another coffee hero when Captain Gerald Coffee's jet was shot down in Vietnam. He survived seven years as a POW and today is alive and well and tours as a motivational speaker. So what about this famous street spanning monument? Well, in 1911, the Modesto Morning Herald held a contest to name the arch. The grand prize, $5. James Hanscom's Nobody's Got Modesto's Goat got the most votes and the prize money. But in the end, the city decided to go with the second place slogan that we're more familiar with today. So, from the famous arch, we travel back in time to McHenry Avenue. To take us there, we enlist the help of this woman. Hi, how are you today? Betty Bell Smith is 86 years old and has no plans of retiring anytime soon. She works as Vice President of Community Relations at U.S. Bank in downtown Modesto near the corner of 11th and K Streets. I was born in Modesto in 1921, many, many years ago. When she was young, Betty could practically walk across a downtown street to visit the orchards. Modesto was a, a mall, I guess you'd call it, because everything was downtown, just in one little area. We had Sears on this corner and presses on this corner and the five and ten cent store on this corner. Way before Betty's day in 1870, residents wanted to call their town Ralston, after the prominent San Francisco banker who financed the construction of the railroad through town. But he declined the honor, and legend has it that the citizens named their city after his modesty, using the Spanish word Modesto. Some folks say Modesto retains that modesty to this day with its small town charm and friendly people. I think about when I was growing up, how you knew everyone that you passed on the street. Today, downtown hustles and bustles with traffic and development, but as in the beginning, McHenry is still the main artery, the primary street connecting Modesto's rich past to the present. We have McHenry Avenue, we have McHenry Museum, we have McHenry Mansion. Hence, the street McHenry Avenue is named after Robert McHenry, a prominent rancher and banker. He and his wife, Matilda, built the mansion in downtown Modesto on 15th Street in 1883 and lived there until 1896. A block away at 14th and I is the McHenry Museum, originally a library donated by the McHenry family. Most of Modesto is centered around the downtown. Also born and raised in Modesto, Kate Nygaard is very fond of her hometown. My father owned a stationery store downtown on actually on um, I Street. And it was an office furniture and gift store and bookstore and uh, well, it was sort of a, everything in that time. And it was right here behind me. And uh, it, was, uh, it, it was a fun store. I worked in there from the time I was 13. Downtown Modesto is easy to navigate. That set the stage for one of the biggest and most famous cruising scenes in all of the country. Kate remembers those days well. And I have to say that even when I had children, I was back here, I used to drag out at the stop signs here. I had a, a little 65 Chevy that was really good at it. And my kids would get down in the back seat and say, Mom, stop that! You know, I said, well, it's really, you know, it's a bad example, but I don't do it anymore, I want you to know. Famous McHenry Avenue, named for the dignified Robert McHenry, became part of the loop. American Graffiti was definitely part of McHenry. You know, there was a, a drive-in on McHenry called Al's Drive-In and uh, people would go between that and the one Burgess, which was down on 9th Street. And you just sort of would go down McHenry and drag, <laughs> as you would say. While Kate enjoyed the cruising days, she says it was her younger brother George who was really driven by them, you might say. He didn't date at all. He wasn't interested in girls at all. I don't think he ever dated, and so he was really interested in the cars. Well, my brother is George Lucas, the uh, filmmaker, and uh, made Star Wars and American Graffiti. Not only is he himself well known, but actually the American Graffiti story and the look of it is very much Modesto. That's right. The movie American Graffiti was inspired by George's childhood, cruising McHenry Avenue in drag racing souped up cars. An accident changed his life. He really almost didn't live through this crash. I think it was a real change of life for him because he realized that he, 
he might have died. And I think at that point he decided he was going to settle down. He didn't really know what he wanted to do. So then he went over to the junior college and he sort of found film over there. And the rest is history. Since making American Graffiti, Modesto has recognized the famous filmmaker with a statue in an area called George Lucas Plaza. It's smack dab in the middle of the cruising district, a busy intersection called Five Points, where five major streets come together. There's Needham, it's over there, and this is Jay, and then 17th, and Downey, and then down there is McHenry, starts right there. The days of soda pops, drive-in restaurants, and cruising were immortalized by George Lucas. But Johnny Matthews is also determined to keep a piece of the 50s alive here in Modesto. We're the only town that can say we have American Graffiti, the movie. It's made us famous. We have people come from around the world just to see the birthplace of American Graffiti, and we're bound and determined to keep it alive. Johnny runs an A&W drive-in restaurant a quick blink of your eyes and you'll flash back to the days of hot rods and roller skating car hops. <laughs> the joint also has a jukebox, old posters, and customers have been known to report an Elvis sighting or two. He's alive, very well alive. We have uh, more than one Elvis all the time and it's just part of our uh, continuing effort to bring back the 50s and to celebrate a, maybe a little bit of a simpler life. All in memory of days gone by. Not one, not two, not three, but four rock and roll kings are often on hand to entertain at this heartbreak diner on the corner of 14th and G. Lots and lots of change, but no change here. And the street signs would be happy to see the fact that there hasn't been change in this one corner. Way, way off the beaten path, we journey to a place where both a town and its signs are locked in what park rangers call a state of arrested decay. This is the Bodie, California of today. Its buildings and streets now make up what is known as the largest and best preserved ghost town in the state. A glimpse down the now lonely Green Street provides a hint of what once was. Because at one time, nearly 10,000 people lived here, all searching for their piece of fortune buried deep in the nearby bluffs. Located about two and a half hours south of Lake Tahoe, Bodie got its start in 1859 when Bill Bodie and Black Taylor discovered gold here. It took 20 years for the population to boom when larger deposits of gold and silver were found, and by the end of 1878, Bodie had grown into the second most populous city in the state. Historians believe the town once had somewhere between 600 and 800 buildings, and 200 of those still stand today, purposely locked in time. Rested decay from 1962 was a term that was, um, that was placed so that the, it would kind of uh, freeze time, you might say. We don't wash windows and we don't, uh, we don't go in and wipe off the tables and the furnishings and things of that sort. Frozen in time are buildings like James Stewart Kane's house, who at one time owned much of the property in Bodie, the town jail, the Methodist church built in 1882. There's also a sawmill and a schoolhouse. The vault is all that remains from Bodie's only bank, and at Boone's store and warehouse, you can still see recognizable brand names on the shelf. And then, of course, there's the standard mill, where much of the town's gold and silver were processed. On first glance, every bit of it seems dead or dying, but a closer look shows life can still be found here. Everything has a personality, even during the day, as the sun goes over this place, the personality of this town changes. The way this town lights up and glows and early mornings and, and afternoons and the silence of the place and, and the occasional thunderstorm and things, I think those are the things that, that uh, people should be looking for. And history buffs should take time to look for Bonanza Street. Now overgrown with sage, this was quite possibly the rowdiest and roughest street in the whole country, infamous for its gambling parlors and gunfights. When gold became scarce, people left Bodie, taking only what could fit in a wagon. Now their eerie reminders contribute to what's become a photographer's paradise. We have uh, the third Saturday of every month set up for 
specifically for photographers if they'd like to come in. They come in before the park opens, photograph all day long, and they can stay after, after hours until sunset or a little, little after. Today, those photographers, along with others who love the park, are leading a grassroots effort called Friends of Bodie. Their goal? To keep this town, its historic streets, and the memories of those who lived here from permanently being lost. The biggest threat would probably be just time. We have severe winters here, and um, the buildings are old. They're all made of wood. Our membership's growing every year, and people, people come here and they love Bodie. They fall in love with this place, and, and they volunteer time, which is extremely important. Um, they donate money for projects, um, and uh, that's what it is. It's, it's a lot of love and dedication will keep Bodie alive. You wouldn't think that something as simple as a street sign could hold the key to a wealth of hidden history. The memory of a person or an entire town can be kept alive by a simple street sign. It makes you wonder what fallen heroes, or bygone towns, or famous inventors you're driving by every single time you get in your car. Now, if you have a story about a street sign, we'd love to hear about it. Log on to kvie.org slash viewfinder and share your story with us. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. I'm Jack Gallagher. Well, on this episode, we head to the gold-laden foothills where the rich history of mining mixes with street signs to create a potpourri of fascinating tales. <laughs> what was that? All right, everybody. That purse doesn't go with his shirt. Too many earth tones. You can jazz that bag up with a couple of rhinestones. We've uncovered the history behind the names of some very first local streets, the ones that run right by your house. Beep when you go by. To order a DVD copy of this program, call 888-814-3923 or visit kvie.org slash viewfinder.